Let's just get right to it. Proverbs 17, 28. And as always, I'm just always grateful and honored and humbled by the opportunity to come before you guys and give you a piece of the word as I receive it from the Lord. So Proverbs 17, 28 says, even a fool when he holdeth his peace is counted wise and he shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Lord, we just come before your presence and we thank you, God, for your word, your powerful word, God. And we pray, Lord, that you would just speak to us, God, that you would speak to us to watch our words, God, and what we say and the things that come forth from our own mouths, oh Lord. God, that you would speak through me, God, to relay whatever message you desire, God, to speak to your people and that together we would grow, God. We would grow in your word and in your presence and in the knowledge of you. I thank you, God, and we give you the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. It seemed a lot, um, a lot of... Uh, instances over the past couple of days where I was hearing about um, your words, your words, your words, things that you speak, things that you say. And so um, in Genesis chapters one and two, um, we see that God had spoken, right? And, um, it, and there were several accounts of it. There were about 10 accounts where it says God said, and then something happened. Um, Seven of those accounts, um, God said, and creation occurred, whether it was light, the earth forming, um, animals being made. So we, we see that words can be creative, right? The words that we speak can be creative. Um, now, unlike God, you know, we can't make things out of existence. We can't say grilled cheese sandwich and poof. You know, there's one instantaneously out of nothing forming in the air, right? But we can create an atmosphere by the words that we speak. So we see that seven times God said something and a creation happened. In Hebrews 11.3 in the Amplified, it says, By faith, that is, with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power of wisdom and goodness of God, we understand that the worlds, universe, ages were framed and created, formed, put in order and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. They were things that were made and equipped for an intended purpose. And so when we speak and we're creating an atmosphere, we should do it with an intentional purpose. Now, we can create a lot of different kind of atmospheres, you know. Um, I, I know i got a coworker, and she's very, she's just a ball of stress all the time. So when she comes over, my little cubicle was all peaceful. And then she walks in and she's like, oh, honey, ooh, ooh, you know, and, and all of a sudden the tension rises. And then this other lady in another cubicle, you know, she, she can get a little boisterous, right? And so you hear her and she's like, well, I don't know what to do with that, you know? And so all of a sudden tensions are rising because of the words that they're using, right? They're creating a stressful environment. We can create a stressful environment or we can create an environment that the Lord can habitate in, right? So, um, you know, I remember when I was in Bible college, you know, we, we thought we would be fit, but we didn't want to go outside. We were like too lazy to go out, but we, want, we, but we wanted to be fit, right? So we would walk in our dorm room and, and you know, we just pretend and, and then we'd start talking, you know, we'd have this conversation. I'd be like, oh, and then we'd just start messing around like, oh, look at those trees. Aren't they so pretty? Oh, I love it in springtime, the flowers. And, you know, we're just, we're, we're creating this whole garden parkway in our, in our, uh, in our dorm room. And I remember one time we were, we were doing it and we're like, oh, this is so wonderful. It's getting a little dark, huh? I was like, hey, do you know, did you? Did you notice we passed somebody? I think, I think that person's following. Okay, let's, let's speed it up. I think that person's following us. You know, and we're in our door. And we're like, no, no, I really think he's following. Okay. <laughs> you know, 
know, we, we started running in our room and our dorm, you know, because we had to get our, our adrenaline pumped up. We were trying to, you know, create highs and lows. But we really created some fear in our room all of a sudden. Well, I really felt like some guy was chasing us, right? Because we used our words to create that atmosphere. And it was spooky. You know, we can create discontentment with our words. Um, the children of Israel we see in Exodus 16, 6 through 8. Uh, King James Version, it says, And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel at even, Then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. So they've already come out of the land of Egypt. They've already experienced all the pestilence. They've seen God work on their behalf. They've seen how Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And then, you know, he released them and let them go. Um, they saw the Red Sea crush the, the, arm, the chariots of Egypt. And yet it says, and in the morning, this is Moses and Aaron talking to them. Then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are ye, oh, and what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, this shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which you murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So sometimes we can create even discontentment with our words and things that we think that we're just offering constructive criticism is really just murmurings, right? It, it's creating an atmosphere of discontentment. You're, you're, you're creating something where now you're like not satisfied with the victories that you had. No longer can you praise God for bringing you out of, you know, a, a, let's say a life of addiction because now, oh man, you know, I remember I used to have money back then. I used to have money to feed my habit, but now I'm struggling to pay my PG&E bill. Right? That's a murmur. That's a discontentment that's, that begins with the utterance of our own lips. So our words are very creative, right? It can create and change and shift an atmosphere in a way that either can cause us to be discontent with the Lord, discontent with our life, fearful, scared, like we were in our dorm room. You know, I, I'm a, I dealt with a lot of fear. One, one time, I'm just telling myself, one time I was sitting in my dorm and I, you know, my roommate wanted, she, one of my roommates, she was so funny. She would, come over, tell me a story, you know, and, and she'd be, oh, turn off the light, it's too dark. And so one day she wanted me to come over and I said, I don't know. It's kind of dark. I feel a little nervous. And then I was like, no, no. What if something's going to get me? Like, what's going to get me in my dorm room? You know, I didn't want to. I, I, I was like, uh, no, I feel so. I feel something in here. I was like, uh, I'm not I'm not putting my feet down under this bed. Like, no, you know, and, and to the point where I got really I was like, Tari, no, you come over here and pray for me. You know, so she she had to come and pray because I was stirring up fear in the room. Right. <laughs> With my own words. Creating shadows out of nothing. And we can do that. So we, we, can, we can bring discontentment. We can bring shadows. We can cause fear with our own words. We can be very creative and create this terrible atmosphere. Or we can create an atmosphere in which God can move. And that's the whole point of having prayer before service, right? We don't come here and silently sit here. And expect something to move, right? Right? When we come in here, we're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, I'm entering into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. You begin to bless his wonderful name, right? Oh, God, thank you for getting me here on a Sunday morning because, you know, I was up all night. Lord, you know, we we're just having our pizza and our root beer and, you know, playing games all night. But, God, we are here early in this morning to give you praise. You know, oh, Lord, I'm a little sluggish this morning. You know, Sunday means that Monday is coming, but, God, I'm right here to praise you, right? We're, we're coming in here building up up an atmosphere that God can move so that when people, unbelievers, those that are coming for the first time, they can walk into this place and go, ooh, I feel something. There's, there's something different about this place. There's something different about this church. 
you know, it's not just a building. Okay, yeah, yeah, you know, they're, they're a little different. They're a little loud. They're a little boisterous. But there's something different in the atmosphere. You can sense it, right? When there's an excitement that's building up, it's like, ooh, something's going to happen, right? There's just this, this buildup. And we set that when we come in and we use our words to create an atmosphere, an environment that God can work, an environment where he can say, man, my spirit, I'm just going to rest in this praise here. And they got me feeling like, God, I am God. But you know what I'm, you know, like, <laughs> just imagine the Lord like, man, they're making, me, they're making me sound really good. I mean, I know it's all there in the word and they're just repeating some of that back to me, but they really believe it. And then we create an atmosphere that someone can walk in and freely receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I know I've testified about it before, but my dad, he, he went to, uh, uh, he had come, you know, he would come to watch me sing, and he came to an all Spanish speaking service. My dad does not know Spanish. He knows tacos, burritos, orale. That's about it, <laughs> you know. But he sat in that service, didn't understand a single thing, and received the gift of the Holy Ghost because of the atmosphere that was established in that place, right? Paul and Silas, we see in Acts 16, 25 through 26 in the New Living Testament, said, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening. See, people around you, they're listening. They're listening to the words that come out of our mouth, not just here in this church, but when we're on the street, when we're on our job, wherever we're at, your kids are listening. And some of them could say, mm, is that really how Christians should talk? You know how we get, us kids get sassy. I got sassy with my mom. But she wasn't Christian, so, you know, that doesn't excuse it. I'm just saying, you know, like, I couldn't say, oh, Christians don't talk like that. You know, she didn't believe in God at the time. So, um, but yet... There's that, that um, shifting that we can cause, right, with our words. And so here, Paul and Silas, it says that even though they were in jail, they're praying and they're singing hymns to the Lord, right? And the other prisoners, other people that are in captivity, other people that may be in your position or may be in a position that you used to be in and they know your background, they hear that and they see that and they go, how can they be singing? Just today, my coworker, because it's, um, we're, in the, we're in the agricultural business, right? So we go through seasons. This is our harvest season, so it gets really busy. And this, one, this year is a little different from every other year. Um, we've got a lot of new people, a lot of shift in leadership and everything like that. And, and so, so we have some old leaders come back, you know, and, and, and so there's just this, this, you know, trying to find our balance, right? And so, and so everybody's stressed out and everybody's short. I mean, I walked into one room and one lady was like, look, don't get short with me. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I was like, ooh. And the guy was like, no, you got short. He, and then he looked at me, he goes, can you step out? I'm going to talk to her. And he closes the door and I'm like, ooh, okay. You know, so that very stressful, tense atmosphere over walnuts, right? And, and my coworker looked at me today and he goes, why don't you look stressed? Why, why aren't you stressed? You know? And I was like, I don't look stressed? And he was like, no. And I was like, mm, Jesus, <laughs> you know, right? Because I wasn't, I didn't have any kind of words like, <gasps> you know, or like, no, don't get short with me. You know, I mean, I really saw a hand go up. I was like, we're professionals, right? But here we are, right? So people are listening to our words and the prisoners were listening to the words of Paul and Silas, the prayers that they were praying, the songs that they were singing. They may not understand what they're talking about, but something is stirring, right? And it says, suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. That's what we do when we come to prayer. 
right? That's what we do when we come before service and set the atmosphere. That's what we do when we're at home praying so that when people come into our home, they can say, wow, it's so peaceful in here. I don't know why I always fall asleep on your floor, but it's just so peaceful, you know, because we've already shaken the foundation in our home. We've already set an atmosphere where God can move. You know, you can even begin to pray on your job and watch how things will begin to shift and to change because God is a, a God that can shift the foundation, right? And so this is what happened because of their, their words, because of what they were speaking and singing. Their words were creating an atmosphere for God to move, an atmosphere of breakthrough. And that's what we want to do. We want to create that atmosphere of breakthrough rather than of discontentment or stress or strife. We want to create this atmosphere with our words. And so our words are so important. And if we can't, and if we haven't mastered it, or if we feel like we're about to slip, guess what? Even a fool, when he holds his peace, is counted wise. Even a fool. You know, sometimes I hang out with friends and they're really intellectual. Not all of my friends are intellectual, you know. <laughs> that sounded bad. No, <laughs> you know, just on a whole, you know, you got some friends that are like, like uh, Eugene on Adventures in Odyssey where he's just like four syllable letters every time, right? So sometimes when I'm with them, some things go a little over my head. So I just go, hmm. You know, or whether I'm with older people and they're just talking to me and I don't really know. I'm like, that's interesting. And somehow they think I'm smart, right? <laughs> I pass off one day, they're going to find out, you know. But until, and then I go away and I go, hmm, let me look that up, right? <laughs> I'm talking, find out what they're really talking about. Or, you know, they'll ask me an opinion and I'll go, hmm. I really haven't thought that one through all the way, you know, <laughs> because I'm just like, I don't know really what you're talking about, but I don't want to look foolish. <laughs> so, but our words can be creative. So if we haven't yet mastered it or we feel ourselves slipping, hold your peace and say, okay, Lord, I'm finding it hard to formulate some words here that can set the right atmosphere. This person is driving me crazy and I just want to tell them something. But that's going to bring strife. Or that's going to bring division. Or that's just going to bring chaos into this room. So help me formulate the right words. Right? Because our words are creative. And then in Genesis 20, well, chapter 1, verse 28 and 29, we see God said again. Actually, let's just look there. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't type it out. But he says, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So we see that God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. Um, and then he said, I'm giving you something, uh, every herb bearing seed for you to eat, right? So sometimes our words are instructive. Sometimes our words are commanding. Our words um, delegate and remind us who we are, right? Um, they, they instruct us in a way that we can realize our purpose. He was telling him, be fruitful, multiply, and you have dominion. He was, he was establishing something in them, right? So 1 Timothy 4, 
1 through 12 in the New Living Translation. It says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars and their conscience are dead. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable or holy by the word of God and prayer. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. So he was saying the Holy Spirit teaches us some things, right? And there's going to be other people that are going to be falling away. They're going to be turned away by deceptive spirits, teachings that come not from the Lord, right? And these people are going to be hypocrites, they're going to be liars, and their consciousness is going to be dead. And why? Because they're saying things that are not true. They're saying things that don't apply to them anymore. They're saying, you need to do this to be saved. You need to do that to be saved. When really all they needed to do was follow the words of Jesus. They were putting extra little twirlies when there shouldn't be any extra little twirlies, right? They were putting extra steps into the manual that was not required of them. They were trying to change their identity and put them back into a place that they never even came from. So they're trying to establish these things and these rules upon them and say, you need these things to be saved. You, you, you need, to, this is how you live. These are the extra steps when all God said was repent, right? Be baptized in his name, be filled with his spirit. You know, there were, there were, the, the, there was his word, but people were trying to put extra on the word and extra things that, you know, trying to fatten it. Maybe they thought, oh, it looks a little skimpy. Let's beef it up a little bit, right? But when when God had spoke to Adam, he had said, no, you have dominion. You have rule. This is, this is something for you to do. These are the things that you need to do. Don't stray from my word. So our words can be instructive. And then Paul goes on to tell Timothy, he's like, when you explain these things, guess what, Timothy? You're going to be a worthy servant. So our job is to explain the word of God in a way that we can nourish one another, right? Strengthen one another to bring somebody else into the fold and explain the word and, and break it down for them that they can receive it and receive the Lord. Um, and then he said, you know, um, Timothy, you'll be a worthy servant, one who is nourished by the message of faith. Now I can testify to that just yesterday. I was talking to my coworker. She came over um, you know, we were laughing about some little incident at work and <clears throat> you know how the sales guys all like kind of hop, rub shoulders, but all us little minions are doing all the work, right? So, so we were joking like, hey, how come they get a gift card to Ruth's Chris, but his admin's doing all the work, you know? And, and then the sales guy even asked me one time I did something for him and we're, this is the one we were talking about. And, and he said, um, Hey, Linda, do you drink wine? Because he's a, he's a wine lover. And I said, no, the strongest thing I drink is Mountain Dew. And he was like, he was like, oh, okay. You know, like he didn't know how to receive that. And, and then so my coworker's like, well, you should have told him, well, I like to decorate, you know, and you could give me some empty ones so I could, you know, decorate them or color them, you know. And like she's saying all this stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, so I could take the Santa Cena, right? And, and I forgot she's... She has no background in Christ. And so, you know, and, and she comes from a, another culture where they do sacrifices. Very, she's very, you know, very old, traditional, but not knowing Jesus or his word. And so I was like, yeah, so I could take an actual Santa Cena with the real stuff. Huh? You know, I was like, holy communion. And she was like, mm. 
And I was like, oh, I was like, oh, I forgot. So then I start talking about, I was like, well, Jesus instituted it when, you know, he was with his 12 disciples. And I just kind of like started telling her about the communion. And then I felt like I had to go a little further back to say why he was talking to his disciples about it, you know, because one day, you know, he was telling them, explaining them stuff. They didn't understand it. Well, he was going to die on a cross for his sins. Uh, well, the reason why he did that was because way back when, so I'm like, I took it all the way back to Genesis. It gave this little, and she's just hovering over my desk, and she's like, uh huh, uh huh. And we're, you know, we're talking, and, and she goes, wait a minute. So, and I mean, I took it from Genesis all the way to. Uh, the day of Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And I was like, yeah. And there, and it says that the, it looked like clothes of fire, like little fireballs were on top of their head, but they began to speak in a heavy language and they were speaking in tongues because the Holy Spirit was in them. And she was like, wait, wait, wait. She goes, so there's God and there's Jesus and there's the Holy Spirit. She goes, but you're saying they're one. I was like, yeah, they're one. It's one God and his name is Jesus. And so, I mean, we just went through this whole little short Bible study from Genesis to day of Pentecost and, you know, talking about then Peter said, repent, you know, and the people's hearts were pricked and all this stuff. And I went through it. And afterwards I was like, man, that was refreshing, you know, because I was kind of tired. Honestly, I was tired. But as I began to talk to her, it was like, Ooh, I'm feeling refreshed, right? Because when you begin to talk about the Lord, you begin to get energized. It's like you're eating from the own stuff that you cook from, right? All of a sudden, you're beginning to get nourished and refreshed all because you're just sharing the word. And it wasn't like I went and in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 it says then unto them came man you know like it wasn't like that I was just telling man I felt like I was telling a comic book or you know or relaying a movie I saw but I was like yeah and it's real and I was like well I know it's real because I spoke in tongues and so you know and I was like, like just going on and feeling refreshed by it you know that's what that that's what Paul was talking about he said you're gonna be nourished yourself by the message of faith because you're reminding yourself of what you believe in. You're reiterating it to yourself. Man, this is the God I serve. Oh my word. This is the God I serve. You know, he died and they buried him and then he rose again and he lives. But, and then he came back just to show people that, you know, he was real and he like let people see. And I was like, yeah. And then there was this one disciple, Thomas, and he was like, dude, I'm not going to believe until I touch you, you know, until I put, you know, and then so Jesus was like, all right, touch me, you know, and so, and I, I mean, I, that's kind of how I told it to her, and she was like, uh-huh, okay, okay, yeah, and she was just, wow, and I was feeling refreshed, because I was like, wow, that was the Lord, he showed up, he showed up and he and then I was like and he said it's more blessed to believe having not you know seen than it is to see I was like that means us I was like I'm believing it because it's real right and I got refreshed just by telling her in like five minutes breaking down the gospel from Genesis to the book of <laughs> to the book of Acts right but but that's what our our words can do it was instructive, you know, it was informative, and it was relaying not just the gospel, but it was telling her God is trying to bring back a relationship with everyone. And I was like, that means you. That's everyone, right? So, so it was feeding her, it was feeding me, and, our, and it was just because it was instructive word. That's, that's the power of our words, right? So here he is telling him, you know, you're, you're going to be nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. So remember, it's not just our words, but it's the life behind it. And then he goes on to say, don't waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. 
This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle for our hope is in the living God who is a savior of all people and particularly of all believers, right? So he was like, look, don't waste your words. Don't waste your words arguing with somebody else that is not going to receive it. Don't waste your time with that. He said, you know, just train yourself up to be godly and live godly, but don't waste your time. And he said, teach these things. Again, our words are instructive. Teach the gospel. Teach the word of God, even if it's little things to yourself. Or, you know, right now, what, you know, the scripture that we're memorizing. Teach that to yourself and then teach that to somebody else. Start talking about it. Oh, what does covetousness mean? Google it. <laughs> When you, when you say define and then you type in define in a word, it gives you the Merriam-Webster definition. It automatically pops up on Google. So there, you know, you can say, oh, don't be greedy. Don't be all hungry, excessively hungry for something, right? Don't be covet. Okay, so I get covetousness. And, and you could tell somebody else, did you know what covetousness was? That's teaching. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. And going on, um, be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. Why read the scriptures? Because... The word of God is life. It's power, right? It feeds us, it nourishes us, it strengthens us. So read it. Read it. That's the only way that you're going to be able to reiterate it. That's the only way you're going to be able to teach it. You can't teach something you don't know. You can't teach something you haven't read. I don't play the piano, so I don't try and teach anybody else how to play the piano. I know chopsticks. I took a little piano, but the little piano that I learned, I still would not attempt to teach somebody else piano, right? Because I haven't really studied it. I haven't gotten that in me. And my fingers, well, they don't really span very wide, so you know. <laughs> but when you get the word in you, your reach becomes greater and it becomes deeper. We become rooted, right? That's why you can say, I'm a tree planted by the water that shall not be moved because you've got his word in you. You've spent that quality time in the presence of the Lord and you are rooted and grounded. So words can be creative and they can be instructive. And it's up to us what we teach. Right? It's up to us what we pour into somebody else. We can teach a whole lot of other stuff, right? When I was a little kid, I remember I, I watched Three's Company. And it was me, my stepmom, and my two stepbrothers. And we went swimming and some random other apartment person, right? I was probably like about seven. And we're in that pool. And I think it was, my, it was probably my older brother because he's kind of the one that is more aggressive. And so, you know, he, I remember he did something. I was like, ooh, Junior, blah, 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 right? <laughs> and they were all like, <gasps> even the straight, the, even the other resident, he was like, this seven-year-old girl just said what? You know, and I, I looked around like, what? <laughs> you know, because I, I remember, she's like, where'd you, my mom was like, where'd you learn that? I said, oh, what was on Three's Company, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, you let me watch it, <laughs> so, <laughs> right? Because that word got in me, and that word came out. So our words can be instructive, and so we need to be careful about what word we put in us, right? What are we actually feeding ourselves? So that way, when we begin to break down the word, we're not saying people have to do a little extra to get into the kingdom of heaven. You got to like 
shake this one leg just right when you're when you're praising God, you know, or or you got to roll around the carpet, you know, and that's how you worship the Lord. That's how he really knows that you're really into it. No, that's really not part of the word. Some people do that. And I, you know, if that's what the God moved you to do, then hallelujah, you do that. You roll everywhere, you know, but, but that's not a requirement to get into heaven, right? That's not a requirement that says you're saved, you know? And so I, it's important because our words are important, what we're pouring and teaching into others. So again, words are instructive they remind us who we are, you know, they teach us not just who we are, but our purpose. And so it's important that we get the word of God within us and get his word in us. Um, and then we see in Genesis 2, 18. Almost licked the page. Ugh. And it says, and the Lord God said, once again, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Our words can be compassionate. Our words can be caring. Um, Proverbs 10, 11 in the New Living Translation says, the words of the godly are a life-giving fountain. The words of the wicked conceal violent intentions. When God looked down at Adam, he didn't have any violent intentions. He said, you know what? It's not good that he's alone, right? There was compassion within him. There was life-giving fountain there. And Proverbs 15, 4 says, gentle words are a tree of life. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Again, so our words, we see when God spoke, it was compassionate, but it could be. Our words can be just the opposite, right? It could crush somebody's spirit. Um, there's a song that just came out uh, by Hillsong called 100 Billion. I fell in love with it. And there was this <laughs> one line that really caught my ear, and it says, and as you speak, 100 billion failures disappear where you lost your life so I could find it here. And as I heard that, I could hear Jesus saying on the cross, it is finished. He was saying it's paid full, right? His words had compassion. His words said, you know what? This world, it's made a lot of mistakes. This world is covered in sin. And he says, but I'm taking care of it right now. It's finished. Our words can either crush somebody's spirit or can bring compassion and hope and life. It can cause a hundred failures to disappear. You know, when you, when you speak that word into somebody's life. When, uh, when I was a teen, I, um, I used to march in this drum and bugle corps, and so it, the practices were in Sacramento, and I just got my license, and you know, and, and uh, I wanted to drive my dad's Chevy because I was I learned how to drive in a bread van. I'm 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 prerequisiting this or you know I'm giving you know my side of the story. So I I learned how to drive in a bread van. So I knew like bigger machinery. I felt like I had more control. And they said, "No, you're not going to drive that truck." You know, uh, they said, "Take the Volvo." <laughs> Do you know how sensitive those things are? <laughs> so so it was first rain, something fell, and I tried to get it while I was driving down the 99. <laughs> and when I popped up, I realized the car was veering. So if I was in the Chevy, you know, I'd go like this, and the truck would, right? Because <laughs> it was a king cab, 4x4. Four four. It would take some time to turn. I did that same move in that Volvo and begun to spin, right? And then it flipped, and it ran into the fence on the 99. It's probably somewhere around here in Stockton by the time that happened, because it was already two lanes, and there was a diesel coming by, and they uh, they seen what happened. They had slowed down, and they pulled over, and you know, and they said, "Honey, 
you know, the lady came and she checked on me. She says, we've called the ambulance and, you know, the police are on their way, you know, don't worry. And she's like, um, you know, and you got to understand, we, we, we had blended family issues. So the truck was my dad's, the Volvo was my stepmom's, right? So, so she, I'm sitting there and I realize this car is messed up. I'm like up in the fence. Right? She's not going to be happy about this. And we already have issues. And so she comes over and she's like, honey, um, she goes, you know, the ambulance is this the stranger, right? And she says, um, we smell a little gas. Why don't you turn the car off? You know, she's saying, Tur turn the ignition off, honey, because we smell a little gas. We don't want anything happening further. And I just looked at her. And in my mind, I was like, no, no. I don't want to turn the ignition off. And so, but I was like, okay. So I turned it off and then I begin to sit there because I know we're going to have issues when I get home. And I'm like, blow up, blow up, please blow up. And I contemplated turning the ignition back on. And then I was like, Jesus, if I do that, that's suicide. So can you just cause a spark? It's okay if I see you soon. That's fine. I lived a good life. I was like, blow up. And I really was praying, Jesus, make this car blow up now, God. Make it. Let a smoker come by and flick his cigarette out the window so the car can, you know, because I did not want to face what was going to happen in the house. We, were, we already had a stressful home, right? We, we were not meshing very well. So I was sitting there, like, blow up. And I was serious. I really was praying. I can't turn the ignition. I mean, I really thought this through, you know. If I turn the ignition, that's suicide. I will never see you, Lord. But God, if you, if you do it, if you do it, we could be together right now, you know. And I sat there horrified at the consequences of what was going to happen, but more so of the added stress that was going to be built in the house because of it, right? So... Of course, my dad was on a job, so she comes and picks me up. The car didn't blow up. I'm still here. <laughs> you know? So, there no, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that I could relay this story. So, but I, so I slide into the car, and we say nothing. <laughs> we get back to the house, and I go straight to the room, you know, and I sit on that bed, and hour or two later my dad comes in and he's like and I had already heard them kind of you know mumbling and he's like no Linda wants me to yell at you <laughs> I was like mm -hmm. <laughs> he's like I'd stay away from her for a while <laughs> I was like oh she's, she has my same name that's why <laughs> yeah <laughs> not talking third person he was <laughs> yeah we both were named Linda, so he was like, you know, my wife wants me to yell at you, you know, and I was like, mm. and he's like, so how would you stay clear from her for a while? He goes, I can't yell at you. He goes, because I remember when I messed up, and, and he tells me some great sin that he did, you know, and because he had compassion, right? He was like, man, he goes, it wasn't like you were trying to wreck the car. It wasn't like you were drinking. You know, he's like, I, he was, you know, telling me his stuff. And he was like, see, I got caught actually doing something wrong. He goes, but I can't, he's like, yours was just overcorrection. You know, he was like, it was just bad judgment call for new driver, you know? And I was like, okay, right? That was his compassion. Now, if she would have seen me, there, there might have been a different story, right? But I stared clear for a couple weeks after that, you know. I just made sure I was out of the way. But see, with the Lord, our, and we too, in our own selves, we can respond two ways. We can respond harshly, or we can respond with compassion. And if we can't do that, and we feel like we're going to respond harshly, a fool is better to keep his mouth closed, right? 
Because you would never want to say something that would crush a person's spirit, that would make them think, oh, if that's Jesus' people, I don't think I want anything to do with it. You know, in, in that manner, we have, we, have a, we have a choice to control this tongue. And it's a matter of what we do. But our words, our words really can be compassionate. Our words can be caring. Our words can say, man, you know what? We can judge somebody or we can say, wow, they must be going through it. Looking at the other side, right? Not like, oh, they never get a job. No, maybe they're just really struggling. Maybe, maybe they don't know how to put a good resume together. Did you ever ask them, hey, can I help you with that? See, that, that's a word of compassion, right? So when Jesus was on the cross, he had compassion on us when he said, it is finished. He said, my work is complete. I paid it in full. You know, I, I'm here to bring healing. Isaiah 50, 40, Amplified Version says, the Lord God has given me, the Messiah, the tongue of disciples as one who is taught that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. That's compassion. That's showing love with just our words. So our words are powerful. They can be creative. They can be instructive. They can be creative in ways that wouldn't be destructive, right? Or they can be instructive and build somebody up. And they can be compassionate and loving, or they can crush a person's spirit. And if we don't know how to use our words, let me just read this one more time. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet as we go before the Lord. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Teach us, oh God. Teach us how to speak like you would speak. Teach us to speak in a manner that would create an atmosphere that you can dwell in, God. An atmosphere that you can move in. An atmosphere that you can move so freely that you would usher in healing and restoration and deliverance. God, teach us, Lord, how to speak in a manner that is creative to give you glory and praise and to build you up in a manner that's creative, God, to instruct others of your word, to break down the, your gospel, God, in a way that they can receive it, in a manner that they can say, wow, this word is good. God, teach us, oh Lord, how to be instructive in a way that builds our youth up, builds our children up, builds, God, our homes and our marriages, builds one another, God. Lord, your word says that iron sharpeneth iron. Teach us, oh God, how to use our words in a manner that would be instructive oh god to reach a lost world to to encourage one another to edify one another god lord that we could be a united body lord teach us to use our words god in humility lord not pridefully lord not trying to cause dissension or discontentment oh god but lord in a way with humility god to just honor you lord to be thankful and grateful teach us to use our words in a manner that is compassionate and loving God help us oh God teach us oh Lord to use the words oh God your words God to bring forgiveness God to speak forgiveness to give forgiveness oh God in the name of Jesus to be forgiven teach us oh God to use our words oh Lord to be compassionate like you to say it is finished oh God that the work that you did is finished that we no longer have to live under condemnation God teach us to use our words to build one another up Lord, to remind each other that we are made in your image that we are your children oh God that we are adopted sons and daughters into your fold and family oh God teach us to use our words oh God to remind us of who we are that we can walk with boldness that we can walk with authority oh God in the name of Jesus that we can love like you that we can have mercy like you that we can be compassionate like you oh 
oh God, that we could give all of ourselves like you, God, if we could only learn to use our words like you, oh God. Oh, in the name of Jesus, that requires having your mind, oh, oh Lord. So I pray that each one of us would just dive into your word, allow your word to change us, allow your word to begin to shift us, oh God, allow your word, God, to begin to begin to change our own language, to begin to change our own dialect, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God, so that we can speak like you, love like you, teach like you, oh God, because there's a dying world, and we desire, Lord, to reach them, we desire God to be like you, Lord, for those struggling God those struggling with those thoughts God those memories of words spoken to them words that God created fear words God that put doubt into their spirit words Lord that crushed their spirit oh God in the name of Jesus I pray Lord that you begin to remove every lie of the enemy oh God every word that was spoken to them God that is not according to your word oh Lord I pray, oh God, that you would begin to remove every ill word spoken into their life and that you replace it with your word, oh God. That we would think on those things that are lovely. Think on those things that are pure. Think on those things that are just, oh God. Think on those things that are honest, oh God. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, oh Lord, let us think on those things so that when we open our mouth, oh God, we would give you the praise. God, that we would be able to give you the glory that we would honor you God that we would be diligent teachers oh God of your gospel we glorify we exalt you in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus and oh God if we struggle teach us Lord to hold our tongue oh God until we can speak like you in Jesus name Hallelujah in Jesus name Oh hallelujah Hallelujah in Jesus name Hallelujah hallelujah Jesus